Uh, so, what are we going to do in the next 30 minutes? Uh, we are going to look at key cases of the European Court of Justice on data subject rights in the digital age. And I would like to structure this into two parts. In the first part, we will very briefly look at the GDPR before the ECJ in general and at some procedural issues of the Court of Justice, which are, I think, important to understanding a bit the procedural background of some of the cases. And in the second, in the main part, I would like to plow through with you, so to look in, in the very much detail at three key decisions of the Court of last autumn, those three cases being the two Google cases and the case Planet 49. I've followed uh, with a lot of fascination most of the program, uh, most of the conference so far, and maybe a small word of excuse at the beginning. This uh, intervention is certainly not going to be as gripping, let's say, as philosophical questions on artificial intelligence or other very practical matter, but it's going to be very much restricted to the letter of the law and the letter of judgments. But bear with me because I think we can all have a nice siesta in the afternoon. Okay, so let's kick off. Um, the GDPR, as we all know, has entered into force or rather is applicable as of the 25th of May 2018. Um, it repeals the data protection directive as of the same date, and crucially, any references in other legal texts which were made to the data protection uh, directive are to be construed where applicable, of course, to as references to the um, GDPR. Now, this might look surprising, but although it has been um, applicable for uh, two years, um, no single case of the court has been handed down on the basis of the GDPR alone. So we are still in the phase at the moment where the case law on the GDPR is beginning to emerge. It will not be long before there will be cases handed down solely on the basis of the GDPR. But the only cases in which the GDPR is mentioned as part of the operative part right at the end of the judgment, so as part of, of the judgment stricto sensu, there are only three cases where the GDPR appears, and it appears jointly with the 1995 directive. Those three cases are Deutsche Post, um, one of the two Google cases we're going to look at, and the case Planet 49. You may now wonder why are two legal texts mentioned in the operative part when um, uh, in concrete facts in a concrete case, one would have thought that either text applies so that it's black and white, it's either text one or text two. Well, the reason for this is not rooted in EU law itself, but in national procedural law. There can be situations in which the referring court is uh, faced with a procedural uh, setup in which it has to apply cases before the application of the GDPR, so under the directive, and cases afterwards. So, for example, if um, it's about a declaration of something which happened in the past linked to an injunction for any future acts. In this case, in one and the same case, the national judge may have to apply both texts. So the Court of Justice takes, I would say, a very liberal and pragmatic approach so far. And what it does is it, um, it uh, interprets both texts so as to give the national court the maximum utility in interpreting uh, European secondary data protection law. The three cases we're going to look at uh, in a minute are all handed down in what we call the Grand Chamber. 
the grand chamber means that 15 judges out of 27 now sit on the bench and when uh, and those 15 judges are uh, uh, composed of the president the vice president uh, some chamber of five presidents and then further judges chosen according to pre-established lists all of this is specified in the rules of procedure now what does grand chamber mean uh, let's let's take a step back um, cases which are extremely technical um, which often don't deal with novel issues in EU law are often dealt with by a chamber of three. Uh, a chamber of five um, is, I would say, the standard setup. It's the setup in which most cases are handed down. It's the sort of off-the-shelf solution chosen by the ECJ. Um, and it's about difficult cases, easy cases, but cases which are sort of running the mill of EU law. Um, the full court, 27, um, is extremely rare. Uh, that is constitutional decisions of an enormous magnitude. It happens um, between once every two years and twice a year. That is about the statistics of the last year. Uh, just to give you some fairly recent example where the full court, Assemblée Plénière, um, is resorted to in, uh, uh, in, in, in recent times was a, a decision on Brexit, the Whiteman case, whether the UK could revoke its decision. So it's a theoretical case now, but that was full court. Um, the accession or rather non-accession of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights, um, the CETA, the Canada uh, the trade agreement and the trade agreement with Singapore. So very important constitutional matters are dealt with by all 27. It's quite rare. When does the Grand Chamber come in? The Grand Chamber comes in when uh, the Court of Justice itself considers the case to be important and or difficult. Okay, so it, it's, uh, it's when there are tricky legal questions um, and or questions where the Court can already foresee that they're going to have quite substantial uh, repercussions in the legal and or uh, political and economic life of the European Union. And sometimes even, as we shall see with the Google uh, 2 case today, um, beyond. So let's come to the three cases and start with um, the first Google case, um, which I would describe as the case Google sensitive data. Judgment of 24 September 2019, Grand Chamber has said, a reference from the highest administrative court in France, the Conseil d'État, and about the interpretation of the directive. Um, you will see in a minute why it was about the interpretation of the directive. What were the facts? There were four data subjects who requested Google to dereference links to web pages published by other third parties, which were displayed in the list of search results. Google refused. Um, in order to fully grasp the case, I think I should say a word about what content those web pages contained. Now, um, uh, yes, I should maybe mention uh, uh, two things before we deal with the cases. The first one is that um, since about two years in cases involving private individuals for data protection, so in, in all cases before the court, but by virtue of data protection, those cases are anonymized. So we no longer now have uh, names like uh, uh, Van Doen or uh, Costa against Enel, but we have GC, AF, BH, and ED. So that is also a fruit of data protection. So, uh, so that was the first comment. The second comment is when you later see brackets uh, behind uh, what uh, the ECJ says, those brackets refer to the paragraphs in the judgment. So in case you want to have yourself a look at the judgment, you can quickly go by going to the number which I indicate. 
So, what are the four? Uh, 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 what is the content of the four web pages? In the case of DC, it was a satirical photo montage on YouTube. Um, GC was someone who worked um, as head of cabinet for a mayor in France um, and who was herself running for public office. The uh, video which was placed online YouTube uh, claims that when she was head of cabinet, she had an intimate relationship with her boss. And the video claims that this has repercussions on her political, um, uh, on her political life. Okay, so she wanted this link to YouTube removed, um, claiming that um, since she was, because this was a few years after when she wanted this removed, claiming that um, she was no longer a, a, a candidate for a local political office and that there was simply no interest to keep this link. AFBHED um, are all about press articles. AF wanted uh, to have a press article of the French newspaper Libération removed. Um, this, was, this article was about the suicide of a member of Scientology. And in this article, it's mentioned that AF is or was public relations officer with Scientology. AF says he no longer is, and he would, uh, he ceased to uh, uh, occupy this uh, function, and he would like the link removed. BH uh, is about um, a judicial, uh, it's again a press uh, article, press articles, about judicial investigations into the funding of the French Parti Républicain, um, PR, which no longer um, exists. And it's about um, a, a, an investigation which has been closed by discharging him. So he would also like the link to this newspaper article refused. And finally, ED uh, would like to see dereferenced links to uh, newspaper articles in the newspapers Nice Matin and Le Figaro, um, which are about a criminal hearing concerning him, which led to a sentence of seven years imprisonment and 10 years social and judicial supervision for sexual assaults on children under the age of 15. So he would like to have this link removed. The first legal question in this case was whether the prohibitions and restrictions of the directive, which relate to the processing of special categories of personal data, also apply to the operator of a search engine. Now, we know since the first Google case that a search engine such as Google is a controller who, pro pro uh, who uh, processes uh, personal data. And we also know that in certain uh, situations, a right to dereference, which is often termed as a right to be forgotten, um, uh, uh, can be invoked uh, against Google, and Google has to remove links to such incriminating articles. The case uh, we're dealing with today is about refining the principles of the Google One case. So I just uh, explained the principle of the Google One case. Um, and the, the difficulty uh, with this case now was that um, in the directive, there is an article on um, special categories of data, that is sensitive data, um, which imposes an obligation for member states to prohibit the processing of personal data, which reveals racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religi uh, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, and the processing of data concerning health or sex life. Now, the obligation in Article 1, uh, 8, Paragraph 1, according to the letter of the directive, is crystal clear. Member states have to prohibit 
such practices. If this were applied um, by the letter, this would mean that Google would have to um, remove any such content without any request being made. Now, in the uh, in today's uh, internet reality, uh, this would mean that Google could, could basically shut down its shop because it does not, no, it claims not to, but it does not uh, read or censor the articles to which it, uh, the, the web content to which it creates links, but it is only the messenger. So already the obligation of the first Google case of uh, 2014 um, is uh, quite uh, uh, tough to implement, but if this would mean that they would now have to screen such content, they could basically asset shut down the shop. So the Court of Justice was faced with the difficulty of applying such a provision um, uh, from 1995. Um, to um, a, 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 a situation of a, of a search engine, which clearly at the time was not in the mind of the EU legislature when it drafted the text. So what did it say? The Court of Justice said, yes, in principle, the special provision concerning processing of sensitive data apply to search engine because um, the directive basically doesn't say anything else, and because the search, in, search engine operator, as a controller and as any other controller, must comply with the directive. However, it was already stressed in Google that all of this is, let's say, only in the context of its responsibilities, powers, and capabilities. So that is the principle. In principle, it applies. As the court specified, only if there is a request of the person concerned. The question which then ensues uh, is, what about the exceptions which are foreseen within Article 8 itself, okay? So if there is an exception, for example, for journalistic activity, what is Google to do then? And in a nutshell, what the court said is that Google has to, when it examines the request, it has to weigh up the different competing interests, right? It has to weigh up the interest of the data subject who wants the link removed with the interest of freedom of information, freedom of expression, we're talking about mainly press articles here, and it has to strike a balance and come to a result. This bestows on a search engine such as Google, now I'm commenting, obligations which are normally carried out by public entities. These are normally state obligations when it comes to uh, balancing different fundamental rights, just something maybe to be kept in the back of the head when one reads and analyzes this case. So Article 8 applies, but it's for Google to weigh up the different competing interests. A small particular question was whether the information, and this is, uh, this concerned AF, so the, 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 the uh, um, no, uh, um, ED, so uh, the guy who was sentenced and where it was about uh, the criminal convictions, uh, whether uh, reporting about the, the, uh, the court hearing um, uh, is uh, falls within offences and criminal convictions within Article 85 of the Directive, and the Court of Justice said, yes, it does. And again, the Court of Justice said the different rights and interests need to be weighed up against 
one another. So this was the first Google case, sensitive data. What I think we should retain from this case is that the Court of Justice had to develop the uh, Google One case of 2014, um, get into the nitty-gritty details, uh, and uh, bestow on the uh, search engine operator quite a lot of responsibility in the end when deciding to accede to a request for dereferencing or not. Second Google case, territorial scope. This was not about um, any refinement of further principles, but about a very basic fundamental question on the territorial application of certain obligations stemming from the directive. Handed down on the same day as the other Google case, again Grand Chamber, again from the French Conseil d'État, and here the court interpreted both the directive and the GDPR. The facts are even more simple. Uh, the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, required Google to remove links to web pages of all on all its domain name extensions and considered geo-blocking insufficient. What does this mean? If you Google your name and you find links which you would like Google to remove, does Google have to do this on also google.singapore, google.mali, google.northkorea? Does it have to do it on google.your member state, so for example Belgium or Luxembourg, or does it have to do it on the domain name extension of the 27 member states? So this was the question, the quite simple question, which the Conseil d'État um, asked. Um, and there was a small sub-issue of geo-blocking. Google claimed that um, technology is now so far advanced that it can, um, with the probability of more than 99%, because it can track the person who is searching, um, work with geo-blocking, um, which would mean that one cannot circumvent um, uh, any searches which one does. Google was only prepared in the case at issue to remove the domain name extensions within the European Union. But the CNIL, the French authority, required it to be done worldwide. What did the European Court of Justice say? It opted for the EU-wide interpretation. It said that the GDPR, and um, if I now write GDPR, it's just for ease of reference, it's also to be read with relation to the directive. But since the GDPR applies now and for the future decades, I think it's easier just to refer to that. So the objective of the GDPR is to guarantee a high level of protection of personal data throughout the EU. Um, and then the Court of Justice starts by giving the arguments for a worldwide dereferencing. Okay? So it says in paragraph 55 that, of course, dereferencing worldwide would meet that objective in full, um, that the Internet is ubiquitous, um, that um, the effect on the person concerned, so on the person who wants to have the dereferencing put in place in a global, globalized world is always going to be there. So if someone Googles me from Singapore um, and he finds me, um, I am going to be affected in my personal right and in my personal right to privacy and to data protection. So the Court of Justice asset starts with giving the arguments for a EU-wide uh, dereferencing. But then it attenuates its position, gives counter-arguments, and comes to a more measured, um, let's say, um, uh, result. And it says, well, first of all, the right to dereference um, 
is a, a European thing, which exists certainly in other legal orders outside the EU, but not at all of them. That, and I think this is crucial to understanding uh, the whole setup of the GDPR, that personal data protection is not absolute, but it must always be weighed with other rights and other fundamental rights. And that in particular, um, here it has to be weighed with, so the right of privacy and data protection has to be weighed against the freedom of information of uh, uh, internet users, and also the freedom of expression of those who place the content initially online. And then the court goes on to say that the legislature has struck this balance as far as the EU is concerned, but not for dereferencing outside the EU. And it bases this on um, uh, literal uh, arguments, so the wording of the GDPR, and also on a teleological, on what the whole GDPR is about, and that it uh, provides for a cooperation um, a mechanism between the national data protection authorities, something many of you know a lot more about than me. Um, and that in EU law as it stands, there is no obligation under EU law for a search engine operator to do a worldwide de-referencing. So far, so good. However, and this is also important uh, to understanding the case, the Court of Justice adds a small caveat at the end. So having come to the conclusion that in principle under the GDPR and the directive it's EU-wide, the Court of Justice says that, sorry, I put the slide too far, and I put you the text because sometimes the best way to understand a judgment, if one can understand it, uh, is to read the text. Um, the Court of Justice says that there is there can be the situation in which national fundamental rights and national data protection law may want to confer on a search engine the obligation to do a de-referencing worldwide. And it bases itself here on the Maloney case law. The, the Maloney case law, in a nutshell, says that in a domain which is not harmonized, Member states can go further in the fundamental rights prote right protection than what the EU legislature provided for in the harmonization, and that they can strike the balancing uh, of uh, conflicting fundamental rights in a different way. So the European Court of Justice says, but it may be that some states will want to impose a worldwide restriction, because that's what their national law provides for. Now, my boss uh, was the Advocate General in this case, uh, so I cannot really comment the judgment. Um, but maybe the thought I would leave with you is this. If now for the future the door is opened up to member states to apply different standards in fundamental rights protection, the cons with the consequence being that there may have to be worldwide dereferencing, we're basically back to square one, which I would have thought was the intention of the le legislature to completely harmonize and to create a level playing field and to create a same level of standard of fundamental right protection and same level means that the weighing between the conflicting fundamental rights has been done on the level of the EU and cannot be done on the level of member states. That is just some small food of thought for you for the future. The third case, and I see that it's 12.30, so I will be 
very brief here. Uh, it's the Planet 49 case, handed down a week after the two Google cases, Grand Chamber, this time from the German Supreme Court in civil matters, the Bundesgerichtshof. Again, joint interpretation of the directive and the GDPR. What was Planet 49 about? Planet 49, the firm Planet 49, um, organized a promotional lottery on its website. Promotional lottery means you enter your name and some data uh, about yourself, such as age, uh, where you live, uh, address, etc. And then you can win a MacBook. Win, win. Yeah. Um, and there were two checkboxes, which could be clicked or not. We'll get to this uh, in a minute. The first one uh, uh, says that the user or the data subject agrees that uh, sponsors and cooperating partners uh, contact him or her by post or SMS, um, email, um, etc. This one could be ticked. So the box was empty and one could put a tick here. And then there was a second tech box, and this was about cookies. Um, and it basically said that the user agrees to cookies being placed on his or her computer. This box was already pre-ticked. So in order not to have cookies installed, one needed to deselect, one needed to actively select okay now the participation in the lottery was conditional on at least one of the checkboxes being ticked okay the case is about the interplay of the e-privacy directive that is directive 2002-58 and about um, the um, uh, directive 95-46 and the GDPR. Basically, the e-privacy directive um, provides, uh, it says that if information is being stored on a terminal equipment, um, the user has to have given his consent. And uh, the consent, in turn, is defined in the directive and the GDPR. So the question here was whether consent was validly constituted if a checkbox was already pre-ticked. And the Court of Justice said that this is not the case because this does not amount to freely given consent. The court said an action is required, um, that uh, this action has got to be unambiguous, and that if someone has to deselect, it is not, or it is less likely to be proven that the person has actually read what he or she uh, deselects and what he or she uh, consents into, so that a passive behavior is not on and it has to be an active one in the form of clicking, okay? So deselecting is not enough. And what the court did is um, it quite smartly perhaps first looked at the directive, said it's not enough under the directive, and then said that since the GDPR is even more stringent uh, in the definition of the consent, already according to its wording, then a fortiori the same reasoning applies in the context of the GDPR. A small sub-question um, which was less important uh, was whether there's a difference whether the information stored in the cookie is personal data within the meaning of the GDPR and not. And the court said that it didn't make a difference because this is nothing that would be specified in the e-privacy um, directive. And the first uh, sub-question was um, which, uh, whether the, uh, which information the service provider um, uh, has to give concerning the duration of the cookie 
and whether third, uh, third parties have got access to it. And the court said yes, because clear and comprehensive information has to be given. So this was a quite, um, one can say, data subject friendly uh, judgment of the court about consent in the context of the internet. Um, it's surely not the last case uh, to have reached the court. Currently pending is the case Orange Romania in this respect, C6119, uh, which is also about consent and ticking boxes, albeit in the analog world. So not um, in the internet, but on proper um, handwritten, no, not hand, on, on proper typed um, contracts. And a small uh, a question which, a big question rather, which stays open uh, since Plan 49 because it was not the subject of those proceedings uh, and which of course is a very contentious matter is if consent is freely given, if uh, the user has to give his personal data in order to participate in the lottery. Basically, if he can sell his data in order to be able to win a MacBook. Um, A.G. Spuna has written uh, a couple of paragraphs about this in his opinion, um, but the court has not addressed this question because it was not part of the um, uh, proceedings before the National Court and not part of the questions which were posed to the European Court of Justice. Before I conclude, I would just like to mention that there are three further cases which I consider quite important in the domain, um, but which, because of the brevity uh, of time, I didn't want to analyze. Um, those are cases C4017, Fashion ID. That's possibly the most uh, important one. We can maybe speak about it in the discussion. That's about the installation of the like button of Facebook on another web page. Um, and then two cases which are about video surveillance, C70818 TK, that's a case from uh, Romania, and C34517 Buivitz, a case from the Latvian Supreme Court, which are about video um, surveillance, so also possibly um, uh, digital uh, uh, digital rights in the uh, digital sphere um, for uh, data subjects. We can maybe speak about this in the discussion, but I wanted to mention those three cases for you if you really want to have an even more complete overview over everything. But I see that I've gone eight minutes over the time, so I happily conclude, and I'm looking forward to your questions.